Hey, Sanger Bible Church, how's it going? Scott Carolyn here. Um, this week, we've been walking through Holy Week one day at a time and kind of releasing a video each day talking about the events of the, the day and some things to think about. And so today we find ourselves on Good Friday. And I'm going to, in just a second, walk through the events, but a couple of things that, to preface this before I get going. One is, um, obviously, this Good Friday is a massive day in human history. Everything changes after the events of Good Friday. And the text has a ton to say about it. And so we're not going to be able to cover it all in a short, short video. So I'd encourage you to open up your Bible and read through the gospel accounts of Good Friday. Um, better yet, read through all four gospel accounts of the Good Friday in one sitting and just kind of immerse yourself in it. Imagine what it would feel like to be some of the different people and characters a part of this story. Um, and the other thing I would say in, in relationship to that is don't skip through Friday and run to Sunday. Um, oftentimes we want to run straight to Sunday in the resurrection, but there's a lot that we can learn if we'll sit in kind of the, the mixed bag that is Good Friday. There's obviously a ton of good that happens, but there's also a lot of pain and shame and isolation um, and things like that. So don't run past it. Um, but let me run through, kind of skip a rock through some of the high points of the day. As I said, I'm not going to hit them all, so um, read through it yourself. I'd strongly encourage you to do that. We're going to start kind of just after midnight. Uh, early Friday morning, uh, Jesus and the disciples had been in the garden and praying and Judas shows up with a mob and he um, betrays Jesus with a kiss. At that point in time, um, Peter steps up, grabs a sword, uh, acts all tough and cuts the ear off of the servant of the high priest. Jesus then rebukes him and heals the ear uh, and then is grabbed and taken away. All of the disciples, for the most part at that point, run and scatter and hide to the point that one of them barely makes it away without any clothes on, and, um, and then they're gone. Most of them are, are not in the picture for the rest of Good Friday. Jesus is taken to the house of the high priest, Caiaphas, um, in a roundabout sort of way, and put on trial. And one thing I want you to notice is that this all happens in the middle of the night, under the cover of night. Um, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day, they needed this to happen quickly and they needed it to happen with as few people as possible knowing about it. And so they did it in the middle, literally in the middle of the night, um, probably waking up some of the religious leaders to show up at this trial. And um, so they put Jesus on trial. While they're putting Jesus on trial, outside is Peter and John. This is the famous story where Peter denies Jesus three times before the rooster crows. And at the third time, in one of the accounts, it tells us that Jesus makes eye contact with Peter. And he immediately runs away in shame, knowing that he just has denied his Lord and Savior and his rabbi. He's denied even knowing him, and he's just full of, of guilt. And so he runs. Uh, after that, the trial continues, and, um, and Caiaphas is trying to figure out how to pin something on Jesus that would result in his death. And the only way he can do that is to can get Jesus to, to blaspheme, to claim to be divine, to be God. And he has a hard time at first doing that, but eventually he gets Jesus to confess to being God. Jesus um, pulls from Psalm and Daniel and, and says that he's the son of man, which is a divine um, title. At that point, you can see the response to Caiaphas. He, he rips his robe and claims blasphemy, and he has exactly what he needs. But the Jews can't carry out the death penalty. They need Rome to do that. Rome, as the rulers of the day, have said that we are the only ones that can carry out the death penalty. And so um, they take Jesus and they march him over to Pilate. Um, early in the morning, probably in you know, 8, 9, 10 in the morning, something like that, they show up at Pilate and they put him on trial. A Pilate initially wants nothing to do with it. After just a short interaction, he realizes that Jesus is innocent and he knows and thinks that um, the religious leaders are just jealous. They're jealous of Jesus' teaching and his followers. And so there's nothing here that would... It is criminal or should result in the death penalty. And so um, they push on Pilate and Pilate decides he has a way to kind of wash his hands of it. And he knows that his buddy Herod, who rules up in Galilee, is in town for the festival in Jerusalem. And so he ships him off to Herod and says, hey, Herod, you deal with him. And so they take him to Herod. And Herod is actually excited to see Jesus because he's heard that he's this miracle worker who does signs and wonders and he wants a show. And so Jesus shows up and he says, oh, I'm excited to see you. Let me see what you can do. And Jesus doesn't give him what he wants. And so he tires of him pretty quickly and sends him back to Pilate and says, no, this isn't my problem. This is Pilate's problem. They take him back to Pilate 
And the mob and the religious leaders of the day again tell Pilate that they want Jesus killed. Pilate doesn't understand why, and so the religious leaders know that they need to convince him that, that he's a threat to Rome. Because he doesn't care about blasphemy. Pilate doesn't care about blasphemy. But he does care if this Jesus is a threat to um, Rome and to the empire. And so they convince him that Jesus says he's the king of the Jews and wants to do an earthly revolt. He wants to overthrow Rome. And once they convince Pilate of that, there's a little bit of fear in him, but still not enough for him to really believe them. And so he tries a couple different ways to get out from um, the situation. One, he has Jesus beat. Uh, almost to death, and then brings him out and says, see, we punished him, isn't that good enough? Uh, when the mob says no, and the religious leaders keep pushing, he tries again, he says, hey, what about this? How about I release a prisoner to you? You can have Barabbas, who's a thief and a murderer, or you can have Jesus. And he, you know, Pilate's thinking, they're gonna pick Jesus, right? Like, that's an easy decision. But they don't, they pick Barabbas, at which point Pilate washes his hands of it, literally, and says, his blood's on your hands. Um, and they marched Jesus off to the cross. While Jesus is hanging on the cross, before he dies, um, a couple of things happen. He has an interaction with the, the disciple, the apostle John, where he entrusts his mother to John. Uh, he has an interaction with the thieves that are on the cross next to him, who initially, both of them mock him. One of them ultimately comes to faith in him. Um, and then he dies a terrible death. And he experiences something that he's never experienced in his life, and that's separation from the Father. He talks about, he asks the Father, why have you forsaken me? He's never experienced a brokenness and intimacy in his relationship with the Father, and he does in this moment. Um, after that, Jesus is taken down from the cross, and something kind of remarkable happens. Joseph shows up, and Joseph is part of the Sanhedrin. He's part of the religious elite, and he asks for the body, and Pilate gives it to him. And then Joseph takes Jesus and buries him in his own family tomb. And this is remarkable in a couple different ways. One is um, Joseph is taking a huge risk in asking for the body because he's identifying with a known traitor, uh, a, a crucified and killed traitor. And um, there's a good chance by identifying with him, he also could be convicted of the same thing. He could, he could be risking his own life and for certain his health by identifying with Jesus. And so it's very risky for him to do this, but he does it anyway. And he takes the body and he puts it in the tomb um, and does initial burial um, you know, rituals with him. And so that's kind of the day, real fast. Um, but a couple of things as you read through, I want you to, to think about. One is, um, which of the characters do you identify in the story, identify within the story? Um, there's multiple examples of both courage, but also of fear, of cowardice, uh, of shame, um, uh, probably anxiety and anger. Um, you've got Judas, who obviously betrays Jesus on one end. Um, and then you've got on the other end, you've got the Apostle John and some of the the women who are followers of Jesus, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and others are willing to risk their lives by following Jesus to the cross. Um, you've got Joseph who, who is a, um, acts courageously. You've got a Roman centurion who professes faith in Jesus. He's the first one after Jesus dies to say, surely he must be the, the son of God. Um, but then you also have most of the disciples who run and hide, who are probably asking questions of, did I really know this Jesus anyway? And he's, he didn't live up to my expectations and he didn't become, he didn't overthrow Rome, become our, our king and our ruler like I thought I was going to do. And who, who do I, should I believe anything that he said and taught while he was here on earth? Um, and they're also fearing for their lives and that they're being associated with him. And so who do you identify with? If you're anything like me, there's some days where I feel like I act in courage and others where I am complete opposite. Um, the other thing I would want you to pay attention to is, um, and this, this probably goes without saying, but this, um, cost Jesus dearly in multiple different ways. Obviously, physically, it cost him. Um, and then separation from the Father, it cost him. But also cost him relationally. Uh, imagine experiencing most of your earthly friends, those you were close to and followed you, um, deny you and run away and hide and want nothing to do with you while all this is happening. And so he experiences, obviously, a, a massive physical toll, an emotional toll, a relational toll, He's um, shamed and humiliated. Um, and that should be both jarring to us, but also help you recognize how much he values you and how much worth you have 
in him that he would be willing to do this. Um, and so there's a couple of things for you to think about. Um, I think in closing, um, I would just love to pray for us as a church. And so I'm going to read a prayer um, and then, um, yeah, we'll be done. Would you pray with me? Lord, when you were misunderstood, you silently forgave, but we so often respond in anger. You gave us opportunity to choose you, but for so long we have chosen rebellion and demanded your death. You were scourged and wounded. You deserved no punishment, but you were punished in our place. When you were already hurting, you embraced the cross. The soldiers hoisted your cross on high. You were their prisoner, but no one took your life away from you. You gave it willingly and freely. It was love that held you there. Lord, may we be a people that live in light of that love. Amen.